Welcome to another edition of the What is Global Health podcast. Today we'll be talking to Dr. Rishi Goyle, an assistant professor of emergency medicine at the Columbia University Medical Center and the newly appointed director of undergraduate studies in the Institute of Comparative Literature and Society at Columbia University. In his many occupations, Dr. Goyle explores what it means to listen to patient narratives, the stories and perspectives of those seeking care. He is also one of the editors of the medical humanities journal Synapse and has been a contributing author for the Living Handbook of Neurotology. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Sure. Um, thank you, Jesse. Thanks for uh, kind of inviting me to talk a little bit. Um, so as Jesse mentioned, my name is Rishi Goyle. Uh, I am an assistant professor of emergency medicine uh, at uh, Columbia University Medical Center, but I also hold a joint appointment in the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics, as well as in the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, where I am the director of the Medicine, Literature, and Society program and the director for undergraduate studies in the Comparative Literature program. Thank you. You're a proponent of patient narrative in healthcare. Can you give us a description of what this means? So, you know, I think uh, as the listeners may or may not no, uh, science um, and medicine in particular is kind of treated as a positivist science, um, whereas a narrative uh, tends to focus on kind of the individual patient stories, lives, and contexts. Um, there's been a growing movement of interest in non essentialist or non positivist or um, non-strictly biological uh, forms of knowledge about people's lives. Um, and medicine needs to kind of deal with the whole patient and um, kind of all the aspects that sort of make a person a person. Um, you know, narrative in its simplest form is uh, storytelling, and it's a way uh, that we all kind of live our lives, right? We live uh, lives in a sort of storied form um, in which we have a context, uh, usually a narrative arc, a plot, character, um, mood, voice, kind of all the formal elements of narrative are uh, probably present in our everyday lives. And how do they present in a clinical setting? So narratives are constantly present. I mean, I think if you go back to uh, what some people would call um, the founder of American medicine, Osler, um, you know, he claimed, and I think this is sort of a, a dictum now that's been repeated all, over and over again, that 85% of all diagnoses come directly from a patient history. Uh, we use the term history, uh, but that it's no different really than a patient narrative. Um, a patient tells you um, what's wrong with them, why they're there, what's what they're feeling, um, ways in which uh, their illness or disease or experience came about, started, ended. Um, it really ends and starts with uh, the patient narrative. Um, everything we do in medicine is uh, functionally a product of that narrative. Uh, outside of that, we're mostly technicians, and you know we're good technicians. And technical medicine has. Um, you know, done a lot of things from um, transplants to um, reproductive, reproductive assisted technologies. Uh, but really, the kind of key question of what and who is medicine for uh, is going to be told to you by your patient and their narrative or their story. And how did you become interested in patient narrative? In particular, I'm interested in what motivates you. Huh. I mean, it's a good question. It's not, this isn't my, so my career has been a very um, kind of, let's see, uh, desultory, ambulatory, um, chaotic, haptic career that uh, has sort of come about um, through multiple, you might even call it like stochastic random uh, interactions. Um, I was an English major as an undergraduate, um, focusing on really the 19th and 20th century kind of Victorian um, and French novel, um, how novels work, um, kind of how characters proceed through nov novels, um, how authors create narrative, in particular through the idea of a narrator. Um, but I went to medical school, and in medical school, I kind of found uh, that there were some incredible moments, but there were also a lot of disheartening moments, um, mostly around, uh, I would say, either bureaucratic failures or even failures of our imagination. Um, and by that, I mean kind of failures of our imagination to encompass, approach, um, get close to the otherness of others. 
Um, and uh, I went off and left medicine and went to graduate school uh, in English literature, uh, where I pursued kind of more work formally on narratives, novels, literature, in some ways maybe ethics too, um, and its relationship to witnessing. Um, and and I, I, I kind of halfway through my you know uh, graduate career, returned back to medicine in a very different frame of mind, one less concerned with uh, I think test scores and um, kind of excelling in in um, very typical ways, but more kind of focused on patients, their stories, and really the service aspects of medicine, the fact that we were there for someone else uh, in the care of someone else, um, and the only way to really do that was to kind of understand why were they were there. Um, and, in, and by that, I mean their kind of larger um, place, not just their small, tiny interaction with the healthcare industry, but really, um, you know, their ambitions, their desires, their needs. And, and each one of those would be different, right? I mean, I think that's another piece when you talk about narrative, what makes narrative such an interesting and important and necessary part of medicine is it's the science of the particular. Um, whereas medicine is often, um, when it's treated like a science, is kind of about genera generalities, right? We give the same patient, you know, the same dose of medication based on a normal concept of a 70 kilogram man, um, but don't really personalize uh, medical care enough. Um, and that kind of focus on narrative, uh, even more than something like culture, ethnicity, or race, uh, which are complicated terms, allows you to really um, pay attention to the person in front of you. Um, and so just from the sake of, you know, interest, right, uh, there's something really valuable to kind of thinking in narrative terms. Um, one of my favorite quotes that I kind of uh, bring up, not infrequently, is um, something that George Eliot wrote. Um, and she said, uh, the greatest benefit we owe to the artist, whether poet, uh, playwright, or novelist, is the extension of our sympathies, um, by which I think she meant that the artist, any artist, um, allows us to extend our understanding of other people and their existence, um, allows us to appreciate their presence, um, allows us to, I wouldn't say enter into, but even simply encounter the idea that there are other minds out there and they might be different than yours. While that seems like an obvious statement, I think it's in practice not as clear to most people. Um, and it's certainly hard to live through. It's very hard to get outside of your own head. Um, it, it's hard to imagine motivations other than the ones that you possess. It's hard to imagine circumstances other than the ones that you possess. It's hard to imagine bodily experiences other than the ones that you have or, or experience. And so for me, one of the great values of art generally, um, and in this case narrative in particular, is that we get maybe a little closer uh, to having that experience. One of the most commonly cited components of patient narrative is culture. How do you think the study of global health uh, should take cultural interactions into consideration in a clinical setting? You know, I mean, again, culture, the culture concept has a, you know, strong hundred year history um, in anthropology um, that we, you know, maybe uh, won't get into so much other than to say that um, I think sort of experiencing the otherness of others is really critical. Um, and that also means, you know, trying to kind of encounter them in their own terms. Uh, by which, first and foremost, I think I mean language. Um, you know, especially in the medical context, and we can think about this globally in terms of public health, um, the, the one fear I have around uh, certain approaches to public health is that they can um, reproduce uh, colonial encounters with um, kind of hegemonic uh, forms, right? With uh, white Western powers deciding that they know what's best for um, sort of brown marginalized um, uh, peoples from sort of countries that are usually often former colonies of one of these other countries. Um, and so how do we kind of break out of that structure that we've had in place for, you know, at least 150 years to 200 years now, um, this sort of neo-colonial order? 
And so that's my kind of first uh, concern about a kind of global health mission. But I think one way that we can uh, sort of subvert that paradigm is potentially through uh, language learning. And it's one of the of the things that we focus on in the Medicine, Literature, and Society program is the importance of uh, foreign language learning and trying to really get at the particularity of other people. You know, the, the problem I have with culture um, as a concept that that can be, um, uh, it, it can be sort of, it can, it can, what it can do is it can limit the uh, interest in the particular. Um, it, it sort of can allow us to uh, think in terms of generalities um, and really uh, dis and, and sort of extinguish difference. Um, so that, that's what I'm sort of concerned about when we talk about culture in a kind of global, you know, natural history form. Um, you know, that being said, if we can start by truly uh, approaching uh, the other through their language, um, I think you start to get on a more kind of even footing, or at least you, at least you attempt to do that. And there, there's a, there's I think a natural humility that um, comes from trying to speak in a language that's not your own, um, especially if you're if you're if you're acting or speaking from a position of power. One of the things that I find sort of surprising is that so many of our medical schools are in um, areas in which many people who live there don't speak English as their primary language. And many of our medical schools are in urban centers, um, often for kind of various complicated reasons, uh, in, in poor urban areas. Um, and there's been this sort of unwritten um, deal that medical students would um, maybe provide a service to the community, but therefore they would then be allowed to kind of learn from these sort of marginalized bodies. And that, that's something that we have to be really, I think, um, uh, we have to kind of be more thoughtful about in terms of what sort of exchange we've allowed for. But um, in many of these communities, uh, English is not the primary language that's spoken, and yet there's no requirement for any medical student, or for that matter, any kind of health humanities student, or any kind of health student generally, to have to learn a language. I mean, you know, we require introductory physics, and we require introductory chemistry, but we don't require language learning. Um, and that seems like a grave mistake. And what advice do you have for healthcare students interested in pursuing medical narratives as a focus of study? I think so. It's an ex exploding field. I think generally, I mean, the, the sort of health humanities turn, it, we're coming into it. Uh, I don't think we've crested the wave, but for example, even in the last fifteen years, we've gone from you know a handful of programs to almost fifty majors and minors uh, throughout the country. Uh, so there's clearly an understanding that these sort of individual. Uh, kind of narrative or health humanities approaches matter. Um, now I think we have to ask ourselves why they matter. And, um, and I think that's where the kind of next wave of scholarship is going to come. You know, are we going to be able to think in anti-essentialist, anti-racist terms using um, biomedicine as both an example and as a warning? Um, are we going to be able to really think about... Um, gender and sexuality in an era where, um, you know, new forms of uh, sort of bodily alteration are possible that blur the lines of gender and sexuality in ways that had never been imagined before. Um, are we going to be able to think about family structures in different ways now that um, the kind of the sort of his what was sort of historically a kind of limit of biological reproduction is now being overcome regularly in uh, in the um, assisted reproductive clinics. So I think the, the kind of questions that we can now ask of ourselves uh, in terms of, um, you know, what are the possibilities, what are the norms, um, are, are really kind of extending widely. Um, medical schools, I think, are starting to recognize, too, that they, the, that they don't need just more and more technicians. I mean, I think that, you know, healing, that this thing that we call healing, is, is more than a technical skill. Um, now, what is it? Uh, I think that's still something that has to be examined. So th th there are an incredible number of opportunities. Um, also, on, a, on another level, you know, so many people want to write um, or think about their own 
experience of illness. And this, you know, so the illness memoir um, is part of, I think, the just the general explosion of memoir um, that we are seeing, um, both from the perspective of reading. I think people like to fe- to read these stories to kind of feel, I don't know, potentially more connected. Um, but then people love to write them to make sometimes make sense of their experiences. There's a um, sociologist named Arthur Frank who wrote a wonderful book called The Wounded Storyteller, in which he writes about the various forms in which illness narratives can take. Um, and also we're seeing new ways that people are expressing illness. So graphic medicine, for example, is a new genre in which um, writers are using the kind of classic comic book form or the um, graphic novel form to write about and draw about um, the real kind of, I think, complexities um, and the ironies, really, of being sick in the 21st century. Thank you so much for speaking to me today. Are there any final comments you'd like to make? Um, I, you know, I don't know. I just think this is a great opportunity for uh, kind of for me to just be able to talk to you. Um, I think that I think that this is a it's a really great time to be thinking about kind of health and the body it through these perspectives of the humanities and the social sciences. I mean, I think they bring so many things to the table that haven't been present in medicine, um, like structural determinants of health, like the problem of um, race in medicine, i.e., you know, race has been kind of construed as a biomedical category when it clearly isn't, um, but yet different racialized bodies have um, different health outcomes that have nothing to do with biological science. Uh, I think, you know, one of the other things that the kind of humanities and narrative just provides for us is a way to examine kind of value-laden ideologies and the embeddedness of kind of racial and gender categories in um, biomedical science generally. So I think, you know, the humanities will be able to offer this kind of critical stance, almost a position um, th- uh, that, uh, that, is, that is political uh, and that is, um, uh, I think that's going to, I think, make a difference in individual people's lives. Thank you so much for speaking with us today.